Good morning, everyone. Hey, let's say happy Mother's Day to everyone in here all together. You ready on the count of count of three? One, two, three. Happy Mother's Day. Well, happy Mother's Day to all of you who are watching or are here today. Uh, and it's a very special day, beautiful day. Uh, already had a great service earlier and, and have a great service lined up for now. So we're so glad you are here, whether you're joining us online or here in the room. So happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. Um, graduation Sunday is coming up. We're proud of our graduates. It's May 23rd, but if you want your child, your graduate, to be part of the program and the, particularly the book that we put together every year, uh, Dane needs your graduates' photographs no later than May 14th. If you have questions, just email Dane. You can send that photo to him. Vacation Bible School registration is open, and it will end on May 17th. So make sure that your kiddos are on, on uh, that list so they can be a part of that event. It's going to be a great time. Can't wait for that. Uh, you have a communication card that's uh, in your uh, packet today, or you have one online that you can use. I'd love for you to fill that out and let us know how we can be in prayer for you. Are you glad you're here today? Yes. All right. I heard a couple of no's, but I just know they were teasing. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, whether you're glad or not. So let me pray for us, and then we'll, I'll invite you to stand and greet those around you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the gift of a beautiful day, a day where we honor and remember and celebrate the moms in our lives who do so much for us and, and for others. Thank you for all of them. But you're also to us, God, the one who provides. And we're here to worship you. So may you be glorified by everything we do today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, stand and greet those around you if you would.
Second to let his hands stop hurting. <laughs> we love that song. But I think we love that song because of the, the zeal behind it, right? The power in the church and what God calls the church to be. That's what we're here for. We're here to celebrate and praise and worship because our God has done great and awesome things. Yes, absolutely, we see the world and the creation around us, around us, and those are awesome and wonderful things. But he's done awesome and wonderful things in us. That's our testimony. That's our praise this morning. You know, I tell, tell the band all the time, we should look like, we look like we believe what we're singing up here. And as Christians, it's the same thing. We should look like people who believe, who have been changed by the power of what God has done. And let the Holy Spirit show them what life was meant to be like as he works in and through your life. And so that's why we, we picked this song, one of the, one of the biggest... <laughs> things in, in, in looking different and being different is that you're telling people what God has done for you, the good things in your life, the amazement, the wonder, the healing, the hope, things we've just sung about as the church and what we bring. Those things are done in and through us by the Holy Spirit, and we get excited about those things. We have passion because of those things. It, it just, it boils out of us. And so my hope is that as you live your life, that passion is just visible to all around you. That God is not just this person we come and, and, and check off a box and, 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 and check into worship on Sunday, but it's something that, that literally just fills our empty cup. And so we praise his name because of that. And this, this song says, I, I want to shout that. I want to shout that love and that hope and that peace and that passion, I want to shout it from the rooftops. Because that, it's so important, not just because it matters to me, because if God knows, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. And that's our hope and our prayer this morning for our community, for our city, for the people that surround us every day, that they can come in contact with the love of Christ. And as we just sung about the church, we are the church that brings that to them. So come on, let's continue worshiping this morning and just lifting our voices.
Amen. You can be seated this morning. We have a great uh, celebration this morning. And it's not just Mother's Day. We actually have so many people in the room that I can't tell if Lexi and Lillian are here to be baptized. So if you are here, if you'll just come up after, I pray. If not, then we'll get her next Sunday maybe. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this day. We thank you that you have let us be in your house today. Let us be in your house on this Mother's Day, on the day that we celebrate our moms and those spiritual moms that have been in our lives, that have led us and guided us and shown us the way. Oh God, we pray today that you would speak to our hearts, that we would, we would hear the message that Jimmy has for us today. And God, that we would, we would lean into you as he shares. And God, we pray today for moms in this world who have kids, no matter how old, no matter how young, who just need wisdom or they need discernment. They need help. Or they need peace to raise their children in this world. And God, we pray for those moms among us and who may be watching this worship service this morning that have experienced the great pain of losing a child. God, we pray today that their heart would feel peace and that you would restore their joy. Or we pray for the women in this room and watching who have long wanted to be mothers. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't happened for them yet. Maybe it will never happen for them to have blood children. But God, there are so many people in this world who need love. Or teach these women who are still waiting to not do so idly, but to reach out and to love other children, no matter how young or old. God, to teach them who you are or to show them what love is. Lord, we pray this morning for those who, who didn't have a good relationship with their mom. Maybe they're not in a good place with their mom right now. God, we just pray that you would restore those relationships, that you would heal what is broken. Lord, we pray for all of those who have lost their mothers. Or that's a, that's a huge source of support and stability that you have given to us. And God, we just come this morning asking that you would fill them with joy today. God, remind them that you are still here. And that you are still leading and guiding them. And God, we thank you and we praise you for that. We pray for our community. God, we pray that we would become a place that seeks after your face. Or that we would be drawn to you, that you would, would call our leadership in this community, in this state, in our, in our country, in the world, or that you would call them back to you, or that they would seek your face, or because you have promised that when we do that, we will find you. But God, we have to come seeking. And so that's our prayer this morning for them, for us, is that we would come seeking you today. God, hear us as we Draw our voices together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught so long ago. And he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank y'all so much for being here today. Thank you uh, for spending your Mother's Day with us. There's a slide that's going to tell you how you can continue to give and support the church. We thank y'all for all that you do. There's boxes as you leave. You can put your communication card in, drop your offering in. And kids, if you want to go to Children's Church, Miss Lynn is right back over here.
what a joy it is. Anytime we get the opportunity to baptize a child, it's just a, it's, it's one of the holy moments that I look forward to every time. I know Jamie does as well. And, and so standing next to me is Lexi Suther, Suthers and um, her daughter Lillian. And Lillian is coming to be baptized today. How old is Lillian? She's three. Three years old? Are you three years old? Yes, you are. Well, I have some questions to ask you as mom. Is that good? And uh, so here, here are the questions. The, the first one is, do, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Yes, please. Yes. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in Him, and promise to serve Him as your Lord? in union with the church, which Christ has opened to all people. I do. And uh, will you nurture Lillian in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith, and to lead a Christian life? Yes. Perfect. Jamie has some Christ's questions. Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Lillian now before you in your care? With God's help, we'll proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Lillian with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her trust of God and be found faithful in her service to others. We will pray for her that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. That face. So sweet. I told her she was hiding from us. She said, yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on this gift of water, that this precious one who receives it today may be washed by your love all the days of her life. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. What name is given this child? Lillian Day. Okay. Lillian, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May you grow to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, and may he watch over you all the days of your life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Was that not precious? <laughs> I don't know. You guys may not have been able to say, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Round of applause. Thanks, Lexi. Thank you, Lillian. Thanks, Lillian. Great job. Oh, I just love to do that. And what a, what a great day, Lexi, to do it on Mother's Day. Good job. Way to go. Well, listen, we, we're in the series called More, and we are uh, today going to focus on a more that is not like the mores we've been looking at. In the past, what we've been talking about is the more that Christ has for us. There's more to the story. It doesn't end with Easter, which means there's more to our story. And today's more has to do more <laughs> with the more that Christ requires of us and desires for us. And so I want to share that with you. Uh, and I'm, I chose a passage from Matthew chapter 22 uh, that many of us are familiar with, but I love this particular translation, so I want you to pay attention to it as I read it for you. Uh, here's, here's the word. When the Pharisees, you remember them, religious leaders, in fact, if you'll go back and look at chapter 22, you'll see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and others are trying to trick Jesus. They want to catch him uh, with some kind of violation so they can they can bring charges against him. Look what it says. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees who had tried to trap him already, they called a meeting to discuss how to trap him. Then one of them, a religious scholar, posed this question to test him. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, and with every thought that is within you. This is the great and supreme commandment. And the second is like it in importance. You must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. I mean, what a beautiful passage of Scripture there with Jesus speaking to the 
Pharisees and to us. You know, the Pharisees were trying to trap him. And, and what they wanted to do was they wanted to arrest him and convict him here in this instance of false teaching, which is really interesting because if you notice what Jesus did with what he said, he actually convicts them. That's really interesting. And I love the way he answered this. In, in this particular translation, it says, Jesus tells him, and he's telling us how we're supposed to love the Lord our God. We're supposed to love the, the Lord our God with every passion of our heart, every passion, with all the energy of our being, and with every thought that is within us. And that's the way we're supposed to love. That's the more that he calls us to. And my question is, are you loving the Lord like that? Now, what really set all this up for us was a devotion that I read uh, not too long ago, and I shared it with the staff, and it, it was convicting devotion. And it had to do with what's your next generation legacy going to be? What's your next generation legacy going to be? In fact, it's a beautiful day today to talk about legacies when we talk about our moms and the way they've impacted and shaped our lives, and we think about that. So this devotion, is, it's in Radical Wisdom. It's a book that Debbie and I read in our morning devotions. Uh, it's a daily devotional. It's by Reggie Campbell. And here's, here's what struck me. I modified it so it would apply to parents, but it applies to all of us. Here's the, here's the quote. What a parent pursues with fervor, their kids will pursue in moderation. What a parent pursues in moderation, their children will ignore. And you won't know how you did until you see what your grandchildren do. Man, I read that as the opening part of this devotion. I was like, wait a minute. I mean, it, it just kind of hits you in the gut. And, and I, I was thinking, well, this, this, this can't be true. Certainly not always. Is this statement true? Not in my case. Surely not. But then he backed it up. He backed up this claim with the examples from Scripture, and he started back in the Old Testament with Abraham, the father of our faith. I mean, we know Abraham's story, right? I mean, he was absolutely sold out for God. He was obedient. In fact, some people say he invented the word faith. It all came from Abraham and his faith in God. But what about his son Isaac, right? He had the son Isaac. And if you know anything about Isaac's story, Isaac was definitely a godly man. But then there's this little uh, episode where he goes against God's instructions and heads to Egypt. And, and, and by the way, when he goes to Egypt, you remember that he passes off his wife for his sister, something that he, his, his father Abraham had also done. Well, I'm like, okay, well, does the, does the claim hold water when you look at Isaac's children? And if you know anything about his children, Jacob and Esau, you might say on the surface, hey, these are pretty godly folks. But what about the deception Jacob used to gain the birthright, right? You know that story. Or, or, or what about Esau's impulsiveness to swap it for a bowl of stew? He just gave it away. I mean, the point is this. The point is that we must pursue God with fervor, not mediocrity. Because here's the point. You'll see this. Our kids and our grandkids are consciously deciding how important their faith will be to them by watching how important our faith is to us. I'm like, okay, hold on. Man, that's pretty tough. You know, if I'm not pursuing Jesus, if I don't have more passion for him, if I'm not loving the Lord my God the way Jesus said to do it, what are the chances that my kids or my grandkids are going to be doing that? And so then I asked, so what do we do about it? What can I do about this challenge that Jesus lays before us? I mean, how can we find this kind of passion that he is speaking about? And so here, here are a couple of ideas. Here's the first one. If we're going to have the passion that he's talking about, we've got to go all in. We just got to go all in. We, we can't take any chances on whether our kids or our grandkids or those around us, our family, know whether we have a real passion for Christ or not. We just can't take that risk. We got to go all in, which means this for some of us, and, and it was me for a long time, and it's still me at times. I, we got to stop waiting in the shallow end, waiting. It's like I'll get my feet a little bit wet, but... Now, wait a minute now. You're asking me to go in the deep end. No. 
I'm not asking you. Jesus is. And he's not asking you to go into the deep end. He's asking you to jump into the deep end. And that's what we want to do. In fact, we need to make the decision. I want you to hear this. We need to make the decision to be a public, sold out, no holes barred, praying, tithing, loving, grace-filled follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you those again because I want you to say it after me. Here's the first one. Say it after me if you would. We need to be public. Say it with me. We need to be sold out. No holes, no holes barred, praying, praying. Tithing. Tithing. tithing, loving, loving. Grace-filled. grace-filled, follower of Jesus. Follower of Jesus. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's this beautiful moment in the Old Testament when David gives fatherly advice to his son Solomon. You'll find it in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. I read this a long time ago, and I highlighted a couple of words. And, and the first word that I highlighted, you'll see there is a blank in the second one. Solomon, my son, learn to know the God of your ancestors intimately. Intimately. Fill in that blank. Worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord sees every heart, yikes, and knows every plan and thought. If you seek him, you will find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you forever. And and the word that jumped out at me when I studied that some time ago was intimately. What does it mean? to know the God of your ancestors intimately. I mean, you know, the word intimate, there's some other words for it that I found. Uh, There's the word close. You're close. You're you're inseparable. You're near. You're you're, you're thick with this person. You, You are tight with this person. I mean, you've got people in your lives that you can say, I am literally tight. We're tight. We're, we're almost inseparable. And, and these are the people that you spend a lot of your, your life with. This past Friday night, Debbie and I had the chance to spend some time with very, very dear friends of ours in ministries, husband and wife. We've been together for 11 years, and we meet, and, and we're, we're tight. We're thick. We're intimate as a group. And so do you have friends like that? Well, you probably do, but are you like that with Jesus? And, and here's the question. Would your kids describe you as fervent in your love for Jesus? Would they say that about you right now? You know, you're, all right, if you're here and you're saying, okay, good, I don't have any kids, or my kids are grown, hey, I'm, I'm off the hook, I don't have to worry about this, this sermon today, I'll think about something else. Well, no, here's the deal. You also are leaving a legacy. All of us are of some kind. So that means this message is for everybody. Jesus was speaking to all of us. And, and the question would be, would others say that you and I are fervent in love with Jesus? Now, I want to tell you, fervent's not a word that I use very often. I, I don't get up in the morning and say, honey, I love you with all the fervent I can find. It just doesn't happen. But it's an important word. And, and here's, here's what fervent uh, means. It means exhibiting or marked by great intensity of feeling. And here's some other words for it. Passionate, burning, uh, blazing, burning, intense, fiery. Do you you get the concept of what fervent really means? I mean, it's serious. And and so how how we pursue Christ is really important. In fact, C.S. Lewis, it's There's a great quote uh, from him. In fact, Dane uh, would tell you it's his favorite C.S. Lewis quote. And here it is. It's this. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And that's absolutely true. And if true, it's of infinite importance. In other words, there's no limit to the importance of it. The only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. Which, if I remember right, reminds me of something that Jesus said in Revelation Uh, And and he said something about, uh, I I wish that you would be either hot or cold, but that you would not be lukewarm. For if you are lukewarm, he said, he'll do something. What did he say he would do? Somebody help me. Spit you out of my mouth. (laughs) Which which reminds me of of a story in in our son's life. Uh, My mother probably would not like for me to tell this story, um, And I'm sorry about that, Mom, but I didn't always listen to you anyway, so I'm going to share this story. It's a a story about Jim when he was was turning seven. We had a birthday party for him, and, you know, back then what we used to do is we would 
uh, let him have seven of his friends go with him to the birthday party. Now, we were living in Macon at the time, and there was a hockey team. We got some hockey fans in here, I know, some hockey fans. I see them back there waving their hands. And there was a team there, uh, and it was called, listen to the name of the team, they were called the Macon Whoopie. That's like the best hockey name in all of history, Macon Whoopie. Uh, anyway, we, we, we put together this package where we could go and take his friends, and we got seats right down on the ice with this, you know, where the glass is. You know what I'm talking about? Right down on the glass. And, and our hockey team, the Macon Whoopie, they're playing this other team. And you know what happens at hockey games? What? fights. And so they're fighting. And so our little kids are, they're, they're right there on the glass and they're watching this and they're looking at all the other adults and the older kids down the row and, and, and all of them are up and they're beating on the glass. And so our kids decided, Hey, this is what we do at a hockey game. So they started beating on the glass and, and they're hollering at the opponents and like, you want some of me? Come on up here. And I mean, it's like seven year, seven, seven year old. And so um, they just keep doing this, and, and uh, they're beating on the glass, and there's this one moment where there's a face-off or something. There's a little bit of a timeout while they're getting the penalties and all, and it's right in front of our kids. And uh, so uh, there's this one particular bad guy on the other team, and he's, like, looking up at our kids, and they're, like, just beating on the glass. You're terrible. You're, you know, you're bad. You're bad. And, and you come up here and all this stuff. And, and the guy looked like he'd had about enough of these little punks. And so he's like skating. You know how they skate on their knees? And he's kind of skating around. He looks up at them, and he looks right at them. And he, and he takes out his mouthpiece. And when he does, he's got like one tooth. And, he, and, he, and here's what he does. He looks up at them at the glass, and he goes, patooey. And I mean, I don't know what he had in his mouth, but this, <laughs> this, this big wad of whatever comes in. It, it hits right on the glass in front of them, and then very slowly begins to like, those kids were like, Oh, my gosh. That is the worst thing I've ever seen. I don't think they said a word after that. They just sat down quietly and held their hands. <laughs> my mother would not like that I told that story. Two points, though. Here's the first one. They were watching what everybody else did, right? They saw that this is what you're supposed to do at a hockey game. This is the way you live at a hockey game. And then the other point, <laughs> it, it ain't very pretty. When somebody spits something out of their mouth, is it? I mean, Jesus, Jesus said, I, I, listen, don't be cold. I mean, I'd rather you be cold or hot. But listen, what, what you can't be is lukewarm. And if you are, this is what's going to happen. Well, I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want it to happen to me. I want to be passionate about him, and I want you to be passionate about him too. So here's the second thing. You've got to go all in. Here's the second thing that we've got to do, and it's the reality. We've got to eliminate the competition for his love. We got to eliminate the competition. You know, it's hard to be fervent in love with the Lord when we have other things or people competing for our affection. It's absolutely true. Now, don't hear me wrong there. This is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying, all right, I'm not going to love my family or don't love your friends or don't love these people or don't love this in life. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we have to eliminate the competition for what's first in our life. Jesus Christ has to be first. Now, let me tell you what that means, because this is hard. I talked to couples about this when they're getting married. I said, listen, I know you love your future spouse with all of your heart, but, but if you don't love the Lord more, then you're setting yourself up for failure in a marriage. And it's absolutely true. We have to eliminate the competition. He has to be number one. Other things may be good, but here's the deal. If we love them more then we love him, then they become an idol. They become an idol. I didn't really understand that for a long time. And Jamie and Kathy Wright and I have been reading a book. Uh, um, it's called Counterfeit Gods by Timothy Keller. And man, it is in your face about the counterfeit gods, the idols that we have in our life. In fact, that's one of the primary reasons that God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. You know that story in the Old Testament? It's one of those where you scratch your head. How could any father be asked to sacrifice their child? Well, do you know why? One of the reasons God did that? Because God needed to understand that Abraham loved God even more than he loved his son. The one that he had been praying for, the one that he never thought he would have, the one that God gave him in old age, even that son couldn't take Jesus' place. He had to be number one. 
And fortunately, in the story, we know that Abraham chose wisely. He planned to do it. And God said at the last minute, now I know that you love the Lord your God because you would be willing to do this. So don't do it. You don't have to do it. Anything that takes his place becomes an idol. And so, you know, whatever we chase after in the world more than Jesus is really not for our good. It's not. In fact, there's, there's a reality that, that if we get more from the world and the things that we love in the world, it's actually, we're getting less. But if we get more from Jesus, pursuing him, then we're getting what really is more. It really is more. And so, you know, Peter got a dose of the reality of this truth when he met Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection. Remember that story? And I mean, Jesus appears to him there on the shore. Remember, they catch some fish and have breakfast with him. And then Jesus does something to Peter. He says, come here, come here walk with me for a minute. And they're walking along the shore. And, and he says something to him. He uses a word that we've been, we've been using. Look, what, look at it. It's in John chapter 21, verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of God, do you love me? What? More. More than these. And so I'm asking, okay, more than these what? And, and there are a number of things. Do you love me more than these other guys love me? Do you love me more than you love these other guys? Because they've been fishing together. Do you love me more than this life of fishing? It doesn't matter which of those things it is. If you love any of those three things more than me, then you're not where you're supposed to be. And, and Simon Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And so Jesus then gives him, a, gives him a job. Then feed my lambs. Let me see it. Let me see it. Prove it to me. Because here's what the Bible tells us. If we love anything more than, than God, uh, it, it just so happens that God is a jealous God, and he doesn't like that. In Exodus chapter 20, we see this. It says, you must not make for yourself an idol. This is one of the Ten Commandments. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind, of, in, of an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. We've got to eliminate the competition. We do. And there's a lot of it out there. And, and when we choose to worship other gods, guess what happens? It's a generational impact. It is. In fact, read the rest of what God said through Moses in this particular passage. It says this, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. In other words, my sin of idolatry, if I choose something and make it more important than Jesus Christ, that most likely is going to be visited upon the heads of my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. The point of the devotion is this. We've got to eliminate that competition. And, and C.S. Lewis, he was very strong on this, this idea and this concept and this truth because he said that even applies to the love of your spouse. Listen to what he, he wrote some time ago. He said this, to love you, he's talking about his spouse, to love you as I should, I must worship God as creator. When I have learnt, how you like that word? I like it. When I have learnt to love God better than my earthly dearest, who is that? My earthly dearest, his spouse. I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. In so far as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, I shall be moving toward the state where which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When, thing, when first things are put first, second things are not suppressed but increased. And so I, I try, to, try to get this across to us, you know, as often as I can. When we move closer to Christ, the closer we get to Christ, the better our life is going to get. And not necessarily easy but we're going to be better equipped for it. Our, our love of Christ helps us to love those around us better, including our spouses and our children, our friends, and those that we struggle to love. So, so if, you're, if you're falling short there, here's a great prayer to pray uh, for that, and it's this. It's just very simple. Lord, teach me how to love you better so that I can become the very best spouse and the very best parent 
that I can be. What a great prayer. Well, here's the last way we do it. It's to always desire more of Christ and what he desires of us. I want to desire more of him and what he desires of us. And so I, I want to speak to those of us who've been around for more than a minute. And as the commercial says, I, I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. Because here, here's the reality. The question is this. At what point do we give up seeking more? I mean, at what point do we say, okay, all right, I've done it. I, I've, I've given it my best shot, so I'm just going to sit back down, put my feet up, drink my lemonade on the front porch, and watch life go by. Well, um, you, you know Kathy Wright here on our staff um, who leads our worship and director of ministry for the traditional service and all of our music here for, for kids and others. She, she's just, uh, she has a beautiful mom. Her mom's name is Mary Wright, and we've had the joy of knowing her uh, since we've been here, and many of you know her too. Well, Kathy got a text from her mother this week. Let me just tell you, her mother is 83 years young, and she's texting her daughter, Kathy. And listen to what the text said. It said this, just praying about what the Lord would have me do with my life. Pray with me, please. Isn't that sweet? Um, you know, Mary lost her husband um, about a year or so ago, not quite a year. And she's trying to figure out what the Lord has for her. She said she would be uh, glad for us to share this text with you. So I'm not, I'm not doing this without her permission. And what a beautiful text that is. What a beautiful heart and spirit that is. And so I know Mary's going to be watching this at some point. And so, Mary, if you're watching, I just want to say to you, first thing I want to say to you is happy Mother's Day. I, I just hope God blesses you on this particular day. But I want you to know that your daughter, Kathy, you know what she said after she shared that text with me? She said this. She said, I would say that my mother is fervent in love with Christ. What a beautiful testimony about a mother. But here's the other beautiful part of it. If you know Kathy, you and I would say, wouldn't we? We would say without question that Kathy is in fervent love with Christ. And, and so Mary, what a great job you have done leaving the kind of legacy that we all should leave. And, and we love it when Kathy shares with us stories and, and, and you know, inspiration that you share with her. You bless us through her. And we're grateful. So I want to say to Mary, thank you for being fervent in your love of Christ. We need to always desire more. No matter how old we are, no matter how young we are, more of Christ and more of what he desires for us. Because here's a reminder somebody said, I like it a lot. I say it in the southern language. If you ain't dead, God ain't done. And it's true. He's still at work. And he's always calling us to us. And I wonder, how do I, how do I keep that alive in me? How do I pursue Christ with fervor? Well, the psalmist wrote about it in Psalm 73 in verse 24. It says this, you will keep on guiding me all my life with your wisdom and counsel. And afterwards, you'll receive me into the glories of heaven. Look at verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And I desire no one on earth as much as you. There it is. That's what we're supposed to do every day of our life. Jesus told the Pharisees to do it this way. Love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, with every thought that is within you. You want more? There's the way to get it right there. But if you've lost it, if you've lost your all-in passion for Christ, here's what all you have to do is just confess it, and ask him to help you build it again. And he'll do it. Ask him to give you more passion. Because your legacy and your children's legacy and their children's legacy depends on it. So what are you going to do about it? Here's some next steps for you this week. How about this one? The first one is, d does your family know that you are fervent in love with Jesus like Mary's family knows about her and we know about her? Would you ask Jesus, maybe, join me in this one? Would you forgive me, Jesus, for those times when I have not been all in a Christ follower? Or the next one, I will pursue Jesus more starting today. I, you know what? I believe every one of us could check that box. All of us could. And the last one we definitely could check, 
I will desire nothing on earth as much as I desire Christ. There it is. And that's the path to more. And when we receive that more, we'll be where Christ wants us to be. So let's pray if we could. Father, thank you for this truth today. Thank you for being who you are and for always calling us to more, no matter how young or no matter how old we are. Lord, teach us to have that kind of passion and energy for you every single day of our life so that those around us would have no doubt that we're fervent in love with you. Help us do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll stand and sing with us as we close out this morning. I just want to take this time to focus in on what we've heard and what God may be working on our heart on. So this is for you to pray, to sing along, but just take this time to, to worship and just let everything sink in. All lovers of Jesus, let your hearts be overwhelmed with Him. To hear His invitation to lay down all of your earthly gifts. So let's focus on the
Good. Listen, we're so glad you were here today. We want you to know how much we love you and are so grateful for all of you. And to all your moms that are here today, uh, from the whole staff, just happy Mother's Day. May you be blessed today. Uh, we look to see you next week. Love you guys. Go in peace. See you then.